Great, thank you, Matthew. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Briglin, the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, it is Friday, April 23rd. This is our one o'clock hearing. And um, we've got a few things that we're covering this afternoon. Um, the first portion of our testimony, we have um, two representatives from, uh, from organizations that, uh, that represent um, uh, uh, different um, folks in state government around the country. Um, first, we have Pam Greenberg, who is here from, the, uh, from NCSL. And um, what we're going to be talking about uh, initially in this hearing is some of the artificial intelligence and automated de uh, decision system legislation that um, is going on in other parts of the country. And this is as we uh, move forward and um, are working on a couple of different um, AI and automated decision system pieces of legislation uh, in, um, in our committee. And so first I wanna um, introduce um, Pam Greenberg from NCSL. Pam, thank you for being here and um, you know, giving us some visibility on some of the things that might be going on in other state legislatures. So welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I'll try and make sure I can share, well, um, can I share my screen here? I'm getting a message. Uh, if you have co-hosting ability, you can um, share your screen. Um, Matthew, moment. I don't know if we can give, yeah, there we go. So I think you can do it now, Pam. Okay. Just one moment here. Yep, take your time. Yep, and we can see it now. It's come up. Now. Oh, great. Thank you. Confirming that. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, again, um, uh, thank you for having me here today, Chairman Briglin and members of the committee. And again, my name is Pam Greenberg, and I work in NCSL's Center for Legislative Strengthening uh, in Denver. And uh, I cover a wide variety of issues, mostly related to technology and privacy issues. Um, and, and so, you know, very quickly, I think I'll, uh, wanted to mention um, some of the services that NCSL provides. Um, we serve our all 7,383 legislators and more than 25,000 legislative staff. And we provide nonpartisan policy research. Uh, we link legislators with each other and with experts. Uh, and we offer training and meetings, of course, for our members. Our DC office staff um, represent or speak uh, on behalf of states before Congress. And uh, when Representative Rogers first contacted me about what other state legislatures are doing related to artificial intelligence and ethics issues, um, I thought about this cartoon. Um, and doesn't this express how we sometimes think about AI? Um, so for me, especially on the right, uh, will AI cure cancer or will it take over the world? So like all issues, uh, it's not black and white and it's never easy dealing with technology issues which change so quickly. So today, um, I'll start with a couple of quick definitions. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk about artificial intelligence as the development of computer systems to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. And then machine learning is a branch of AI focused on building applications that learn from data in order to improve their accuracy over time. Um, and then I thought I would just um, start with a quick view of how new AI legislation is in state legislatures. In 2010, there were no bills that used the exact phrases artificial intelligence or machine learning. And it's still not a huge number in 2021. Um, but there has been obviously a steady increase over the past 10 years. And it's the same in Congress. Um, it's not a direct Congress, uh, comparison in terms of um, mentions in bills, but mentions in the congressional record were zero in 20, 2009, and then up to 129 in 2020. So it looks like this issue is on a path of continued growth here. Um, today, I'm going to focus just on sort of broad brush, big picture AI legislation in states and not on the many other types of um, AI legislation that relate to 
the implementation of specific technologies such as um, autonomous cars where we've seen lots of legislation or facial recognition. Again, we've seen lots of legislation in those areas and I'm not focusing on those today um, with one exception um, being Illinois. Um, I'm gonna talk about that last and tell you more, a little bit more about why I'll include that one. Um, but again, um, big picture. Um, so um, I've categorized here the most common types of uh, state enacted AI legislation that we've seen in the past several years. Um, first of all, legislative, legislation creating commissions or task forces um, that focused on government use of AI, and then finally funding or incentives for um, research um, on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we've seen just seven states with legislatively created commissions. Um, a few others um, are created by executive order, but not very many. Um, and we've um, also, so we've seen, um, uh, as I said, Washington and Vermont, the earliest two created by legislatures, uh, study commissions, and studies. And then um, this also includes what some states are called future of workforce. Um, task forces uh, that address AI. So those are in California, New York, and Alabama, and then uh, and Washington as well. And then um, uh, Utah's Deep Technology Talent Advisory Council, which was created just in 2020. A couple of states focused on how state government uses AI, as I said. Um, a resolution in Delaware asks state government to consider use the uh, adverse effects of uh, artificial intelligence. And then Texas um, passed a law requiring state agencies to consider using um, next generation technologies, including artificial intelligence. Uh, and then um, we've got Utah and California that have set up programs or provided funding for uh, AI research in higher education. And then just a couple of other bills I'll mention in passing, Mississippi uh, enacted a law this year requiring the state's K through 12 computer science curriculum to include um, instruction in robotics, AI, uh, machine learning. And then California in 2019 passed a law requiring, requiring reporting of any net job loss or replacement due to the use of automation AI or other technologies. And that's in, a li in limited circumstances that that's required. And then um, I wanted to, since we uh, talked um, about um, your interest in a code of ethics, um, I thought I would go into a little more detail about California's 2018 resolution, ACR 215. Um, it expresses support for the Asilomar AI principle. Um, and the, the principles were included in full in the resolution. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but they, fall, um, they, uh, they were created when a group of AI researchers, economists, legal scholars, ethicists, um, philosophers met in Asilomar, I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing that correctly, uh, California, uh, to discuss principles for managing the responsible development of AI. And the result of that collaboration were these 23 principles. Um, they fall um, into sort of uh, three main areas, research, ethics, and longer term issues. Um, so under research, they state that uh, AI research should have a goal not of undirected intelligence, but beneficial intelligence. Funding for AI should be accompanied by funding for research on ensuring its beneficial use. Uh, there should be a science policy link. So constructive and healthy um, collaboration and exchange between AI researchers and policymakers. And then under ethics and values, AI should be safe and secure throughout its operational lifetime and verifiably so. It should be transparent. Uh, for example, when used in judicial decision-making, it should be auditable by a competent human authority. Under privacy, it states that people should have the right to access, manage, and control the data they generate, given AI systems power to analyze and utilize that data. 
Um, the principles also, as I said, address longer term issues, for example, um, catastrophic or ex existential risks posed by AI must be subject to planning and mitigation efforts commensurate with their uh, expected impact. So as I mentioned, um, I'm gonna talk uh, about, lastly about Illinois uh, and their Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act. Um, it, it's unlike the more general uh, kinds of laws that we've discussed or that I've mentioned so far, um, it addresses the use of a specific AI technology, uh, video interview software that uses AI. Uh, it is the only state with a law like this and it's received a fair amount of attention. So um, I did want to, uh, to include it here. Uh, since I'm not sure if you're familiar with, the, with um, artificial intelligence videos, uh, interviews, I've, I was not, but it's a, it's a one-sided interview uh, where a job candidate records answers to uh, various questions um, on a computer. And then the software analyzes the characteristics, including the language they use, their speech. Um, and then sometimes, at least in early iterations of this software and controversially, uh, their facial expressions. And then it would provide an assessment of that applicant's suitability for a job um, and a measure of certain traits like dependability, emotional intelligence, and cognitive ability. Um, so if that could be measured by AI. And then after that screening tool was used, it would um, the applicant would or perhaps would not move on to a human interview. So Illinois set up disclosure and privacy requirements around this software. So, um, and um, again, I, I think this was just to be a brief presentation and so, this is the, the end of what I was going to cover today, but I'm um, happy to answer to try to uh, answer questions or um, now or at any point as we go on. Um, Pam, this is Tim Briglin. I'm just curious that the Illinois um, piece of legislation, um, th that has been an introduced bill. It's not something that's been enacted, I'm presuming. That has, it has been enacted. It has it been enacted, law. okay. Yeah. And, and it also looks like that was um, very specific to a particular type of uh, use of, of AI. Um, exactly. So it wasn't necessarily broad in its implication, but clearly someone had focused on, I guess, a concern about that particular application. Correct. And um, you know, I just wanted to mention that NCSL has um, quite a lot, quite a few resources on um, uh, Autonomous cars, our uh, energy and transportation program um, can speak with you extensively about that. We had a special project on autonomous cars, connected cars. Uh, and then in terms of facial recognition, um, that's the other area where we're seeing lots and lots of legislative activity um, That's as a form of AI. And um, so we're looking at a number of bills that lead to law enforcement and AI and um, government use of AI, those kinds of things. So. Um, you know, I just, uh, we, we wanted to focus broadly here, but um, again, if you have questions at some point about other areas, we're happy to um, respond to those. Yeah. Um, Pam, do you mind um, taking the presentation oh, off the screen and then we can see other members of the committee? That. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and uh, I've, I've got a couple more questions, but we've got one hand up. Um, Representative Sims. Yeah, thank you. This is so helpful to get a window um, into what other states are, are thinking about and, and, and very interesting that, that data about just um, numbers of bills and, and mentions. It certainly feels like this is a, an, an emerging um, area with, with lots of focus. And, and you may not be able to answer this, but do you have a sense of um, kind of what's on the table right now or like next year, a, a sense of, you know, you gave us a window into what's passed already in some other states, but what do you see as the kind of cutting edge, leading edge of, of, of next steps? Um, I, you mentioned facial recognition as a piece of that, but if you were to forecast what <laughs> what's coming down the pike that we should be thinking about right now? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think we're seeing seeing more states that are trying to look at how government is using AI and maybe look at 
possible standards for that, guidelines for that. Um, so that's one area. Um, we are tracking legislation this year. Um, there's only been, I think, one bill passed so far. Um, but there, it's similar, what we're seeing out there is similar to the bills in those three categories that I mentioned. Um, so fun, you know, funding, there's also funding being provided um, for programs that may not specifically mention artificial intelligence, but they're emerging technology programs of research in higher ed, and there are appropriations that are going toward those as well. So, um, you know, I'm, um, I think other than the, the connected cars and facial recognition, um, facial recognition just really exploded this past year or two. So um, that's probably the number one area of a specific technology. But otherwise, I think we're seeing, you know, increased look at, um, you know, how, how can you set up guidelines and principles for government use of AI. Um, Pam, a follow-up question I had, and I, I'm just also interested in what other state legislatures are doing. Um, e even though this committee is called the Energy and Technology Committee, really the purview of technology is quite narrow. It's um, simply technology as it's used within state government. Um, that's really our purview. Um, and I'm interested in where the legislative activity is in other state legislatures, because you mentioned some education aspects of how um, other states might be approaching this. There's clearly a commercial aspect, and people are looking at this as a, um, you know, an economic, an area for potential economic growth, as well as concerns about job issues and how, um, you know, labor might be um, constrained by additional AI. Clearly, there's privacy concerns, um, which probably fall more in the civil liberties kind of judiciary committee world. Um, I, I would anticipate that our committee is going to take the lead on this, but there are clearly areas in the education world, in the commerce committee world, in the judiciary world. There might even be others that I'm not thinking of. Where is the action on this in other state legislatures? Um, you know, I think... We've, we've seen, for example, Alabama, um, uh, their commission on AI has done a lot of focus on um, the economy and, and uh, the potential for growth um, with uh, AI. And so, you know, that along with, you know, incentives to companies or programs um, encouraging um, use of AI, we'll see, again, I think, you know, responsible use of AI in government. Um, we'll see, we're seeing, and I'm sure Amy can address this much better than I can, um, but we'll see much more of use within, of AI within state government. Um, and yeah. Well, that. and I'm also thinking of our vice chair of this committee, who's on the ethics committee. Maybe there's a place for the ethics committee to be digging into this as well, but I, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but clearly there's an ethics element um, to this as well. Um, a couple of couple of hands up and then um, we'll bring Amy into the conversation. Um, Representative Rogers and then Representative Ian Tachka. Thank you and thanks for coming in today. Um, I, with, with full recognition that this may sound like compliment searching, um, I recognize that Washington and Vermont were kind of first here with with having bills and I guess I'm I'm curious if have you had other states reaching out to you where and interested in what Vermont is doing or just maybe looking for a compliment, but also genuinely curious to see how kind of the state actions all interact with each other? Thanks. Um, yes. Thank you for the question. I, I, have, um, I have received uh, a number of information requests from other states about the issue. And fortunately, I have been able to send the Vermont's um, report, mission report. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I really uh, appreciate that that kind of great information is documented and uh, available to share with others because um, many times commissions meet and um, it's very difficult to find what the, even the results of the, um, the meetings or the, the commission um, um, guides were. So yes, uh, Vermont um, is definitely uh, a state that I see as a leader in this area and that I share information with other states um, about. 
Uh, Mike? Yep. So, uh, keying off what uh, Sheriff Briglin said, I think that, that makes a good argument for why we should have an artificial intelligence commission because they could look into all these uh, diverse aspects of artificial intelligence and then recommend things that they recommend uh, legislation that could go to whatever committee is appropriate for what they're trying to do or what they're trying to propose. So just a comment. Yep, thanks Mike. Um, Amy, uh, why don't we turn to you now? Um, thank you for being here. And um, I, I don't wanna butcher the acronym for your organization, but I believe it's the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. That's right. Ac yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for being with us and um, giving us a perspective on um, how this is being um, looked at, you know, amongst the, the technology experts in state government across the country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just want to thank Chair Bricklin, Ranking Member Sherman, and members of the committee. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. I'm Amy Glasscock, the Senior Policy Analyst for the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, or NASIO. Founded in 1969, NASIO represents state chief information officers and information technology executives and managers from the states, territories, and the District of Columbia. NASIO does not take positions on specific state legislation, but today I'm happy to provide the committee with some background on the use of artificial intelligence in state government. So first, a definition. NASIO views artificial intelligence as an umbrella term for technologies like machine learning, natural language processing, robotic process automation, chatbots, and digital assistants. NASIO really started asking our members about how they view AI in the last three to four years. Each year, NASIO surveys our CIO members to gain insight on their top initiatives, views, and challenges on a range of topics. Starting in 2017, we asked state CIOs what they thought would be the most impactful emerging IT area in the next three to five years. In 2017, only 29% chose AI. By 2020, that percentage had more than doubled and jumped to 61%. In our first publication on this topic in 2018, we acknowledged that AI was relatively new for state governments, but that it held much potential. Just a couple of states were using chatbots or digital assistants. There were a few examples of states using AI for traffic management and a handful of other small cases. We laid out definitions of AI, how AI could be used to relieve, split up, augment, or replace the work that humans do shared some ideas for best practices, and put forth what some of the implications and challenges would be for state CIOs. Oh, I don't know if the computer wants to reboot right now, so let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> okay. In 2019, NASIO partnered with strategic partners, IBM, and the Center for Digital Government to conduct a survey of state CIOs on their usage of AI. At that point, only 14% of states reported that they were currently using artificial intelligence with an additional 19% piloting projects. A majority of state CIOs in 2019 reported that they were still looking for the right business case for AI. Keep in mind, this was less than two years ago. Then 2020 arrived, as did the COVID-19 pandemic. Suddenly CIOs had found the right business case for AI. With unemployment offices slammed with calls and citizens looking for information on COVID-19 restrictions or testing sites, state government started rolling out chatbots for the first time. NASIO published a report on this in the summer of 2020, which I've included in my materials today. By June of 2020, three quarters of states were using a chatbot on a state website. Most of those were either for unemployment insurance inquiries or general COVID-19 questions. Most of these chatbots were the first the state had ever used, and most of them were rolled out in a matter of days. This was a perfect storm of two factors. One, the chatbot technology had matured to a level where states felt comfortable using it, and two, the pandemic created a strong business case and a need for the technology. NASIO partnered on two more publications that were released that fall. One was a follow-up with IBM and the Center for Digital Government interviewing CIOs about how the pandemic had changed their views on AI. The other was in partnership with EY, studying the governance of emerging technologies. I've also shared these with the committee. 
As you can see, we have gathered a lot of data and statistics on this topic since 2018. So I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the themes that we've seen throughout these publications and our research, as well as an idea of how quickly things have changed over the last year and what may be ahead for the future. The first point I want to make that we've heard over and over again is that CIOs are rightfully cautious about using new AI technologies. The common sentiment is that you don't want to go looking for a problem because you have a fancy new technology you want to try out. Wait for the problem and then look for the best tool. As one CIO said, implementing technology should be about solving a business problem and meeting a need. It's very easy for us in IT to become enamored with a shiny new toy, but if it doesn't provide a better service or make somebody's life easier, it's very likely not worth doing. There are, of course, several challenges in adopting AI in state government. The top challenge, according to state CIOs, is legacy IT infrastructure. It's challenging to apply new AI technology to a legacy system. Many state applications are run on COBOL and other decades old computer language. It can be really hard to find employees that still know how to write that code and integrate it with new AI technologies at the same time. Another challenge is cultural concerns inside the organization. Employees fear that AI will eliminate their jobs or make them irrelevant. But the truth is that state governments everywhere are actually seeing a trend of more available jobs than job applicants. AI can be a tool to actually bridge this gap rather than a threat to employees. That said, workforce resistance to change is real. Another hurdle is the lack of necessary staff skills for AI. Many states will be looking to the private sector for AI expertise if they can't recruit the skilled workforce needed on a limited, unlimited state budgets. So while the pandemic did not eliminate these challenges, the surge in successful chatbot deployment did provide an opportunity for states to look at other areas of AI adoption in the near future. NASIO advocates for a handful of best practices for states looking to embark on greater adoption of AI. I'll share four of those now. One, develop an AI roadmap. Putting AI into your overall technology governance plan can mean the difference between an ad hoc approach full of unexpected problems and a well-designed project. In our 2020 Emerging Technology Governance Survey with EY, only 21% of states reported that they have a formal governance structure for emerging technologies. Two, CIOs should be prepared to talk about disruption to the workforce address employee fears, and use their role as change managers to think ahead to how these technologies will alter, change, disrupt, or improve the work that people do on a daily basis. Three, CIOs should be involved in the procurement process for AI technologies to ensure they fit within the roadmap and conform to security and privacy requirements necessary for safely using these tools. This also helps to streamline the purchasing solutions for multiple agencies. And four, CIOs should consider running pilot projects to try out new technologies before launching them for broader uses. CIO offices may allocate a small percentage of the chargeback budget to an innovation fund for emerging technology or seek a general fund appropriation to create a grant funding model where agencies can apply for assistance to AI pilots without financial risk. The chatbot surge of 2020 was a huge leap forward for states in how they view AI. States are now looking at other ways they may be able to leverage AI in the near future. Here are some examples from five states. Massachusetts is piloting a program using AI to help citizens complete public assistance forms accurately and more quickly. Massachusetts is also looking to AI to assist with cybersecurity efforts using digital intelligence to help staff members sort through network log data to separate actual threats from false positives. Georgia completed a robotic process automation pilot project for agencies to streamline new employee background checks and onboarding procedures. The governor of California last year ordered a request for information to investigate how machine learning might help officials better understand the spread of wildfires and assist fire risks. Texas IT officials plan to look at how AI and machine learning could enhance staff efficiency optimizing costs and promoting innovation, as well as improve the citizen experience, expedite service delivery, and ensure citizens receive accurate responses to inquiries. And finally, Utah is looking at how these technologies can help the agriculture department use an AI embedded image recognition application to identify brands tattooed on stray livestock to return them to their owner. 
In closing, I would just like to restate that unlike at the beginning of 2020, here in April of 2021, state technology leaders have become comfortable with low-hanging fruit AI technology like chatbots and digital assistants. Many are developing pilot projects to investigate other uses for AI and robotic process automation. That said, AI and state government is still new and most states have a long way to go when it comes to the governance of AI. But while challenges remain, the business case for AI crystallized in 2020 and in turn, CIOs appear more committed than ever to the technology. Thank you and I look forward to any questions. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, there are a few hands up and I've, I've got a couple of questions as well. Um, let, let's go to Representative Chase and then Representative Yantachka. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if uh, you had any information or if you could speak for a minute about the uh, the customer satisfaction element uh, with all of these rollouts. Um, how content and well served has the public been uh, A, with this technology and B, with the rapid deployment thereof? Yeah. Um, that's probably hard to measure because I think, you know, especially when it comes to, I assume you're kind of talking about like the chatbot rollouts of 2020. Um, you know, especially when it comes to yeah, the unemployment insurance, people were just so frustrated. So, um, and at the same time, CIOs have seen that citizens are expecting that kind of instant service that they would be able to get um, with Amazon or Target or, you know, Delta Airlines. And so, um, it definitely, it definitely was a huge help and it was a boon to the call centers. Um, and it allowed them not to have to go find more employees at the last minute. Like, like I said, like some of these were, were rolled out in days. Um, and I don't have like specific, uh, metrics from States on, you know, satisfaction as far as that goes. That probably again, was a lot of frustration, but, um, it definitely was a big help on the side of state governments. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, that was essentially my question too. Were there any surveys done uh, as far as how people perceive the chatbots? But uh, you answered that. So uh, let me go on to, um, is there any, were there, were there any extensions of chatbots to say track, um, track uh, taxpayers who were having problems and couldn't get them resolved? And you know, escalating them to uh, to a higher uh, response. Mm -hmm. um, when we did this sort of survey of chatbots last summer, we didn't see any for that. Um, but that doesn't mean that that they haven't sort of spread out to other state websites in that way. Because I, I know some states were kind of rolling out more, but we haven't done another survey of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sibilia and then Representative Rogers. Oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, question, and I don't know if this is for you or Pam actually, but thinking about, um, thinking about uh, the best means of approaching, um, since we're kind of towards the head of the pack here, um, thinking about, or so far, um, thinking about how to approach uh, regulatory framework here for AI. Is it helpful to, do we have a sense if it's helpful to look at like computerization and electrification um, or, you know, if, if these kind of industrial um, revolutions are, are, I mean, is it helpful to kind of compare those and how things evolved and I don't, am I making sense here? To, <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense to me, and I don't have an answer for that, so maybe Pam can speak to regulatory framework. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a, an answer for that either. It's a great question, but, um, you know, we, we talk about principles when you're um, working with new technologies and regulating new technologies being, um, you know, trying to keep in mind that um, how quickly things change and not to uh, sort of stifle innovation through um, over-regulation, but also, uh, you know, recognizing that maybe broader language is better than more specific, you know, uh, things aimed at current technologies because we don't know where this is going. So much is um, new about artificial intelligence. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. We talk about that with even the procurement process. Sometimes it can take so long in state government that the technology that you had been trying to procure is outdated <laughs> by the time you get to the actually being able to get it in your in your hands. So I just wonder if the um, I wonder if there are any kind of breadcrumbs from those, you know, from adapting to those kind of industries that we can follow. That's just something I'm thinking about. Yeah. I'd be happy to see if I can find any information on that. that yeah, follow up with you. Representative Rogers. Um, thanks. I thought this, thank you for the whole testimony, the specific examples of where states are, a few states are heading was helpful. Um, I was wondering if you know in these states that are rolling out different um, models of AI, such as you know supporting people signing up for public assistance, where is the accountability or responsibility if something goes wrong, if someone you know incorrectly gets public assistance and now they have to pay it back, but the AI told them they were eligible, if a fire is missed and somebody dies, is it, is it specified in these states? who holds responsibility when the AI makes a mistake? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if it is specified in every case, um, but we do talk about the importance of, you know, not just letting the AI run wild, um, you are constantly training it. And even once it gets to a more sophisticated level where you can kind of trust the outcomes a little bit better, um, you still need human involvement to keep checking it and making sure it's, you know, not learning things that are false. Um, also making sure that you have good data that's being fed into the AI. Um, you know, it's that old cliche, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So um, a lot, there still has to be a lot of human involvement um, to ensure that those kind of mistakes don't happen. And then if there are, um, you know, huge consequences like life or death, um, you want to evaluate your risk um, when thinking about um, deploying an, an AI and make sure that that what you're using is sophisticated enough or that you're able to take on the kind of risk for that, the outcomes that are possible. That's a helpful way of thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah. And sure. do you do you or does your organization have an opinion of where the responsibility should fall if it should be with, you know, assuming this is AI within state government, should it be whichever department or agency in state government is using the AI is where, where ultimate responsibility um, falls if things go wrong? Or I, I was just curious if that's something. Yeah, that, that is not something that we have taken a position on. Okay, has it come up in your conversation? It hasn't, no, but that's, that's interesting. I, I'm sure it will. Yep, thank you. Oh, uh, another question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Lucy. <laughs> just, just thought. Um, I was just curious if you would say a little bit more about workforce disruption. You had put that as kind of one of your directions, and I was just, if you could give a little bit more um, direction as to what you would be looking for from states in that area. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so. You know, I think a lot of it, the the sort of pushback that that we're getting, that CIOs would be getting from their staff, the workforce is like, you know, but I've been doing data entry for 20 years, like a robot's going to come in and take my job. But what we've actually seen and in the input that we've gotten from CIOs that have done some of these projects is that, you know, the idea is that you have AI to free up some of this mundane back office work and use the humans for the jobs that you still need the human brains to do. And, and the result often ends up being more rewarding for the employee. Um, and uh, a lot of stuff that is like paperwork that people are spending a lot of time on, let's say you have a social worker, for instance, and they spend a lot of time on paperwork. If you can free up some of that time so that they can actually be interacting with families um, instead of filling out paperwork or doing data entry, that's really useful. Um, in addition, I, I briefly mentioned that, um, you know, there's, there's a workforce problem in state government, um, especially in the technology world. You are competing with the private sector. You can't compete with those salaries. So, um, you know, if, if you have a way to get some of that work done without trying to 
go and hire more humans because you can't hire them anyway. Um, that can be really useful. The National Association of State Chief Administrators did a workforce survey a couple of years ago and um, found that while the, the number of jobs was increasing and the number of applicants was decreasing at the same time. So that's a big problem, especially with cybersecurity staff. Um, getting people that are experts in cybersecurity to come work for state government is tricky. Um, so if you can um, apply AI to cybersecurity and threat detection, it can be really valuable. And that is, is one top way that um, state CIOs see AI being able to be used in the future. Um, so Amy, something I was interested in, in hearing your testimony, uh, and um, I will use this to get to my question uh, that's related to AI, but about four or five years ago, Vermont changed how um, essentially the management structure as to how technology is managed in state government. It used to be that every silo of state government had their own technology staff. And uh, I can't remember if it was 2000, I think it was 2017, we consolidated, consolidated that into one particular agency, the Agency of Digital Services, um, that basically is an umbrella agency that manages um, technology across state government and then has individual or multiple folks from ADS that are assigned to different parts of state government. But it essentially feeds up into a, what essentially is a chief technology officer for the state. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how common that management structure is across, um, across the country, whether we're catching up or whether um, states are moving to that uh, model right now. Mm -hmm. But it kind of relates to um, my question of, um, you know, where some of these questions are best kind of answered and managed in state government. And clearly our, you know, CTOs and CIOs are, you know, the chief in government experts on technology. Um, and yet a lot of the questions that are related to um, this type of technology, particularly AI, um, are really beyond maybe the grasp of a CIO or a CTO. They might be very specific to the department or agency in which they're deployed, um, or they may have to do with issues related to civil liberties or privacy or other things, which you know we kind of hope that our chief technology officers are expert in, but maybe they're not at all. Um, and so generally my question is, um, you know, if, if you have uh, thoughts on, you know, to the extent some of these questions we're wrestling with around AI are best managed within a, um, you know, a CTO's organization. Um, you know, we're also talking about a commission here, which would have a much broader um, scope of capabilities within it to deal with these issues. But, you know, is, th is there anything that um, CIOs are thinking about across the country as to, you know, where to, where to actually wrestle with these issues and questions. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, so one thing that we've seen, um, well, first I'll, I'll talk about the consolidation. Um, that's definitely a, a trend that's been um, happening in state government. I think maybe like 20 years or so um, more and more common in the last 10. So yeah, Vermont's like right on track there. Um, we find it really useful to have that structure um, generally at, from NACIO. Um, and we've also seen that CI the CIO role has changed over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So where a, a CIO or you know, CTO, that role used to be kind of a provider of technology services. So you have an agency that has a need and the CIO's office provides them with a solution for that. They have a lot of in-house expertise and solutions and programs. What we've seen happening is the CIO changing from that to become more of a broker of services and um, really going out to those um, vendor relationships that they have created and finding the right private sector solution for agencies and having a good idea of you know, the best solution for an agency's problem or issue, or, you know, also maybe purchasing something that five different agencies can use. Um, and that seems to work really well, too. Um, again, there's that workforce shortage issue, so you have less people that can create things from scratch. 
Um, it also doesn't always make the most sense um, time-wise, staff time-wise, uh, you know, when there's a really good solution out there that you can purchase from a vendor. So um, when it does come to those <clears throat> tough questions that maybe the, the CIO doesn't know how to answer from a technology perspective or it's outside their area of expertise, like we see that as okay. You know, they, they have developed relationships with others that can help them answer those questions and um, get the agencies what they need. So um, that's kind of how things are going around the country. Great. Well, um, thank you, Amy and Pam. I, I don't see any other hands up in the queue. Um, and um, Amy, I think you had mentioned um, some information that was uh, that you had submitted that's posted to our website. Um, Pam's presentation is also presented to uh, or is also um, posted on our website. So I um, really appreciate that's great information for us to be able to refer to and follow up on. Um, so appreciate that as well. Thank you very much. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, really appreciate your time this afternoon and, and being with us. Um, we're going to continue on on another topic now. Um, and you're welcome to listen to some energy regulatory cleanup bill work that we're doing. Um, or if you have better, better things to do, um, you're welcome not to listen to that as well. <laughs> so thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. And right. electric utility regulatory stuff was a past life. So I think I will enjoy the rest of my day. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's good to know that there's life after uh, energy <laughs> regulatory work. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. Take care. I was going to say, Tim, does that count for us too? Yeah, exactly. Exactly.